Good afternoon, greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time, and she's Stacey Mitchell. We all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we have got a ton of stuff to be talking through today. The first is... What's going to happen with rates after this Middle Eastern conflict between Iran and Israel? A home services petition for the commission case was denied by the Supreme Court. We've got a new letter from Freddie Mac about what's going to happen with agent commissions and financing. And believe it or not, Philadelphia is ranked a top 10 city to buy a fixer upper. So buyers and sellers should be listening to this carefully but first you need some, need some engineering help here yeah it's okay okay i can't hear she's but having some headphone issues can but you we'll, hear me on the microphone we can hear you great okay, good. so um so with this this middle eastern conflict i think that you know you, you, rates did not have a good week last week mm-hmm. the cpi data came in a tenth of a percentage higher than where it was anticipated and that caused rates to touch seven um and then we got this conflict going on i mean it was saturday night everything kind of happened uh, fortunately a lot of these drones got shut down but that's not what we're here to talk about because th- there's a question now of is this going to slow the fed down even more with rate cuts if the u.s gets involved in this conflict there's conflicting opinions about this we saw the 10-year yield jump up higher than it's been since the beginning of the year so you know, the, the the big question right now is what's the bond market going to do? Because the bond market will ultimately determine where rates go. And in my view, what's safe to say right now is that if you're holding out for rates to come down, you probably should stop holding on to that belief. What do you two think about all this as we see this reaction to the CPI data, the Middle East conflict and a couple other things happening? Yeah, I mean, it was it was disappointing to see the rates hit hit seven. Um, you know, I think what we've been telling clients um, this entire year is that while there has been talk about at some point in the year, some rate cuts, like only time will kind of tell if and when and how much that happens, as well as if it does happen, how that kind of plays out for offers and you know, what that still does to like to your monthly payment. So I know I had been kind of talking to clients about things dancing in that like mid to upper sixes and honestly wasn't anticipating it hitting seven right now, but here we are. Right. Yeah. I I wasn't expecting that either, but given the uh, inflation that came in higher, um, Mm -hmm. everything else that's going on and especially with the oil prices climbing, I mean, it's, it's really going to affect everything. So the the positive thing is is that there's a lot of financial products out there for our clients to investigate where maybe they do an adjustable mortgage um, where it's the arm is you know fixed at five or seven years. Uh, I had a client just lock in at six point one two five. So there's talk to your lenders, find out what's available for you and what mm-hmm. makes sense to get into you know, the perfect monthly payment. And what did also, they lock into on the arm? 6.1? 6. 6.125. 6. Nice. Yeah, right? And um, and then also consider that it, prices, home prices are rising. Mm-hmm. That And that's going to continue no matter what the interest rates are. So, you know, there's no perfect time. There absolutely is no perfect time. The perfect time was a couple of years ago based on, what my clients say that didn't buy a couple yeah. years ago. Mm-hmm. So, um, and unfortunately they missed out. So if, if you continue to wait, you're going to pay higher because the, the home prices are going to go up. So talk to your lenders, find out what kind of financial products they can offer you. If you look at what Fortune Magazine said, uh, specifically increased tension in the Middle East following Iran's attack on Israel likely gives the Federal Reserve even more cause to slow rate cuts Uh, as a spike in oil prices could disrupt the central bank's battle against inflation. And that's according to Capital Economics. So, you know, that's one school of thought here. Now, other people are saying this might cause rates to actually come down a little bit. And regardless of that, you look at all these things happening. We can't control what happens in the Middle East. We can't control what happens with oil prices. 
We've got an election coming up that's going to be pretty hotly. Con- it hasn't really ramped up yet because there's not like a big primary battle like you normally see. Once the convention season comes around and the summer hits, you're going to see th- th- this election really take hold because there's a lot of unhappy people right now on both sides of all these issues that we're dealing with. And people are uncertain about the economy. So my, my view is this, that I wouldn't bet on rates coming down to your point. But you also got to look at the equity you're losing out on, Stacey. You said home prices are going to go up, right? That That's a major factor for a lot of people. Look at the people that have been waiting since like 21 or 22. I mean, they've lost out on tens of thousands of dollars in equity. Mm-hmm. And then you got to determine where you're actually living and, and what that looks like. So, you know, the folks that said you might see five at the end of the year, I mean, I, don't, I think they're kind of wrong at this point. Like, I'm really not. If we get back into the sixes, that would be great. But if rates go lower, that's going to blow up inflation. So it, it really demonstrates that these these low rates people keep, I would say, fantasizing about in 2024 because they're not coming back. What's ended up happening is that it, it's it's almost put like these rose colored glasses on. They like they're they're hoping for something that's not going to happen. Now, the positive of this, and I think this is a major opportunity. I'm clear we're going to see inventory continue to climb with these rates going with rates com- coming in where they are. If you look at the um New listings data, uh, and uh, if you look at where we were, you know, this time last year. So um, last year it was that, that like, savagely unhealthy number. We were seeing no new listings coming to the market. So in 2022, year to date, we've seen, uh, or at this time last year, we saw 67,229 new homes come to the market. Last year was 48,556. This year so far in 2024, the same period of time, and this goes through, April 15th at 66,786 new listings. So still obviously a lot lower than the pre-pandemic numbers. However, this is a step in the right direction, and we saw a really large bounce. And I'm clear that's going to continue because people are realizing they can't hold out and just lock, if it, it, they can't lock into these rates. We're going to see people that have to move, that, that want to move. They're going to make a decision based on that. So I see that as the opportunity for folks that have been holding out and waiting. And it's also going to be better for agents because I think it's going to be easier to navigate the market. So what, what are you two seeing with inventory? Like, what, 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 how do you see these higher rates? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Am I wrong? Tell me more. I mean, I think even with the higher rates, the competition is fierce. And um, well, it's 2022 not, was fierce. So you're yeah. absolutely right. It's not um, it's it's not causing people to hold back or for the most part or at least for the winning offers are still ones that are very strong and they're not um, taking their price down to make mm-hmm. up for the difference in, in interest rate. There's enough buyers out there that are yep. still plenty yeah. of competition. Yeah. We're still in like double digit multiple offers. <laughs> yeah. You know, Oh, 12, there was 12 offers. I mean, that's, that is exactly where we are today. Um, it's kind of like the asking price is the starting point, and you just go up from there. And mm-hmm. You still have to waive all those contingencies for the most part. That's what the winning offers. That's what listing agents are seeing as far as winning and sellers are seeing as far as winning offers. Yep. So, um, and I think it's going to continue this way because there are plenty of buyers. And every day new buyers enter the market for some reason or another. Motivation, that's the key um, to this whole thing. But I, I don't see where it is going to change as far as... I don't think the interest rates, I don't think they're going to adjust them anytime soon. Maybe not even this year because of all these extenuating situations that are happening. I think it's too risky. Like you said, Tom, it's going to wreck inflation even more where they're still trying to get it to that 2% magical number. (laughs) Um, But the other thing, I'm still seeing that my buyers are the ones that I'm currently working with are incredibly motivated Mm -hmm. There is more opportunity, I feel, and they feel also for them out there. Houses are popping up even at random times. Like typically the normal life cycle is they come on Thursday or Friday. You know, we'll see stuff coming on Monday, have Mm -hmm. our offers in by Tuesday. So it's so random at this point and it it, it just defies logic. So when Mm -hmm. people ask me, can you bring comps? What are you seeing? It doesn't. I know the data doesn't support what's really happening out there. Mm-hmm. I can bring you all the comps you want, but you're really competing against other buyers, and right. it does defy logic. Absolutely. Like, you can you can run all the numbers. You can pool all the comps. You can show where mathematically you right. could 
have things make sense, but that doesn't put in the emotion factor that buyers have. And I love how you said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's the that's the piece that nobody can determine. Right. Like you can't calculate that out. Right. And you you that but that's where you get the over asking price, the waving of of inspections and other things. It's that buyer's emotional response. So and you're competing against buyers. You're not competing against sellers. And I always have to remind my clients that. Right. So, you know, and and I think when when you look at that, there's obviously things to do to win an offer. We've gone over this at length. There's really 10 points uh, that, that, that you can feasibly do to win an offer. But if you're having trouble finding something, when we're going over this as well, expanding your search area, looking for homes with an elevated days on market, meaning like more than like seven or 10, um, which sounds silly, but that's where offers are often accepted in a lot of cases. So those strategies are important. And that's where, you know, a, a buyer agent who really believes in the process can shine and educate their clients up front. What I find fascinating is uh, Lance Lambert from uh, the Resi Club. He put together something called the lock-in effect, and it's a chart uh, across the 50 largest U.S. housing markets calculated by Zillow. So he puts how many homeowners are in there, mortgage-free homeowners, uh, then the mortgage-free and ready homeowners. So what that means is homeowners who are not locked in, they can afford to buy in today's market and don't have an outstanding mortgage. So that has to do with like income, right, and their ability to afford something. And um, the, the latter criterion uh, matters uh, given that almost all the outstanding mortgages at the moment have rates below today's current 30-year fixed average nationally, which is coming in just above 7%. So if you look at the Philadelphia area, um, and just to give some perspective, for the U.S., there's 84.7 million homeowners, 347 are mortgage-free homeowners, 10.775 million are mortgage-free and ready. And that means there's, you know, 41% of homeowners are mortgage-free and 13% have, have, can, can afford something. That's the average, right? So you have about 13% of the population, which, you know, that's kind of normal in terms of who makes a move every year anyway. Like you only have 5% of the population that's really considering a decision. Philadelphia is coming in a little higher. So this is good news. You have 1.644 million homeowners, um, 637,000 are mortgage-free, 259,000 are mortgage-free and ready, meaning there's 16% that are potentially not locked in. That trend's on the higher side of this. Um, only a few major cities come in higher. Chicago's notable. That's one of them there at 17%. Um, and then you've got, it's a lot of smaller cities. I mean, besides Houston, Houston's at 18%. And then you have like Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, Pittsburgh. So you know, we're in a better spot here because the bottom of the list you have any guesses who the who the bottom of the list is and the percentage of homeowners that are not locked in? Mm. I don't know. So it's all in California, the top was, five. Oh, geez. San, San Jose, Diego. LA, San Francisco, <laughs> San Diego's number four, Riverside, Seattle, uh, Denver, Colorado. So a lot of these like hot, hot markets, Phoenix, Arizona, um, you know, Boston's at eight percent. So we're in a better spot here than other markets. So I think that's pretty encouraging. And, you know, that's where you got to dig a little deeper with these folks and get to the motivation and also, like, understand, like, hey, what's your payment now? Where are you trying to get to? What are the pain points? So that, that, that to me is, is encouraging. Um, now, there, there is, um, you know, some other data that came out that monthly payments are now have reached an all-time high, and they've climbed 11% year over year. Uh, this is a report from Redfin that shows the median monthly housing payment is coming in at $2,747 a month. So that's the median. That's, that's a pretty big median. Um, and so he, seeing that, I mean, but you're, you're, not, you're not feeling the, the low in demand here is what I'm hearing you two say from your what, what, what you have going on in the field. No, I'm not seeing any. I'm, I'm seeing fever pitched, actually. People are really trying to sca- scramble to get into their homes. I don't know if it's because they want to get in before the election. I don't know what it is. Right. Or they're tired of, you know, sitting on the sidelines waiting. Mm-hmm. And I know a couple of them, they do have, you know, motivation like baby on the way. Yeah. Um, they just got married and they're tired of renting. So they do have motivation. But I, some of the folks are coming back into the fold and they just want to buy something. Right. I think they s- see where the value is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to rely on the stock market, and that really isn't the economy. And to make your own, you know, pseudo savings account, buy some real estate. Mm -hmm. They're saying that if you bought two years ago and you turn around and sell now. (laughs) Yeah. The return on your investment is bigger than what you can get in the stock market. Right. 
Well, and, you know, I think you said it there, Stacey, is that there's always going to be people that move. I mean, you can't time having a baby or you can't time what people want to do with their lives. I mean, I had a conversation with someone earlier today and they just said, hey, look, I, I'm making a decision to sell my property and I want to go travel. That that has no that's not a financially sound decision, but that's what this person wants to do. And you hear this all the time. Right. And some people are tired of owning homes, like the amount of work that's involved mm-hmm. in owning a property. So you, you can't coach those things. Now, what an agent can do, so we're, we got all this, all these things happening. So what, what are you doing right now that's been the most effective for your business and getting clients to get to the next step? Because, you know, there's, it's always like, hey, I sold a house, I'm interested. But that usually doesn't, isn't the house they buy, right? Is that, is that fair to say? So, yeah. you know, you, you, you identify someone earlier in the decision-making process, and this could be a seller or a buyer. What do you do? to coach them through all this what what's some of the most effective plays you're running right now from a client interaction standpoint because you think about all the stuff we just talked about most people are going to see this and be like i'm not moving but there's people that are going to do it anyway so what are you doing i mean you just sold you know two or three homes you sold one last week you got other off you're writing offers so you guys are in the arena doing these things what what's working right now what's your most effective play you're running with clients sitting down and getting in front of them and going through the entire process Mm -hmm. and, you know, how, what it looks like and different options as far as finding inventory and also how to put together an offer. Mm -hmm. And I think setting expectations is key Mm -hmm. and, and, and getting feedback of what they've heard already from the market. What have you heard from friends? Have you had friends that bought? What, what are they saying? What did they do? Um, And just getting their feedback and seeing, how motivated they are. To me, that's been working. Yeah. I mean, I think for buyers also taking the time to go through um, both, you know, it's not just pricing, like really stressing how important terms are because when you're in these multiple offer situations, most people have pretty squeaky clean terms. (laughs) So um, kind of giving clients like options, like, listen, this is what is ultimately you know, if it's a property that just hit the market and we know that there's multiple offers in, this is probably a, a pretty good breakdown of how they're coming in. You're going to have a couple that are right there at the list price that have the different contingencies. You're going to have some that are a step up from that in, you know, a piece, a side of it. And then like the winning offer is going to both sides of it be, um, be strong. So, um, yeah, just really kind of setting the stage with where the expectations are going to be at and then also kind of almost putting them in the seller's shoe. Like yeah. when they're sitting there, they've got these different offers coming in. They're looking to get to the settlement table with the number that is written with a smooth transaction without like a whole bunch of like stuff that pops up mm-hmm. between now and then. So what could make things pop up? And then kind of like explaining that to them and – um just so that they can see where the seller is coming from. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfect. I love that because if you put the buyers in the seller's position Mm -hmm. and the the light bulb comes on, right? Like, oh, you know, and also I got to always remind them, you're not competing with the seller, right? You're not like the seller. They listed their home at this price point. They know they're going to get multiple offers for the most part. So you're not competing with them Yeah, and they don't care that, you know, the carpeting is dirty. Right, right. <laughs> they they listed the house that way. Yeah. So, and they probably, I'm sure they know the carpet's dirty. Right. But that doesn't have anything to do with it at this point. Right. It has to do with, you know, you're competing against other buyers for the home. There are cosmetic mm-hmm. things that you can change and update uh, as time goes, but this is, this is the house in the condition that it's in. Right. And let's, if you want, if you want to go in on this house and it's the one for you, then we have to figure out how to present your offer in the most strong way as humanly possible within your means, yeah. you know, and exactly. your comfort level. Yeah. So you guys focused on the buyer side. I'm going to look at it from the seller's perspective because, and, and Stacey, you said it, getting in front of people and telling them what's going on. I mean, there, there is so much bad information in the market. I was in an appointment today. They interviewed two other agents. Neither of them gave a price or they shared a property analysis when they went in there. What? So this, this is a listing appointment, right? And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly priced listing appointment. Wow. So, and then I think, you know, the other thing that I found interesting was I got a comment from one of the sellers, and I'm wearing my usual attire. You guys dress like a weenie, right? 
it works. Hey, you're the only person that dresses like me anymore. This is literally what I'm hearing from the seller. And mm. this is a seven figure listing that, that I'm, I'm walking into. Wow. Um, so then it's, I, I think it's educating them on here's what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and from, you know, this was uh, something I helped another uh, agent on our team with. The initial feedback was they were a little aggressive on their price. They didn't see it going that high. I didn't get any pushback on the numbers that looked like it would be a fair market value from sitting down with these folks. So to me, it's education. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, here's the trends in the market. Here's the data, right? Like, Sarah, like you said, here's the data of listings or offers that win. Mm-hmm. Here's what I can tell you. I've lost out on X amount of homes when the clients didn't do X, Y, and Z, right? And then sometimes people still won't listen until it works. Mm-hmm. And then, or they, they lose out on too many, right? To me, it's all about education. I, I don't think you get as much pushback on pricing as agents worry about. What they really care about is what's the timing? What's going on right now? We've got all this NAR settlement news. Um, how's the process work? It's, it's education because the big stressors for folks are getting their home ready, getting it on the market, dealing with showings and everything else. We were talking before the show how, like, some sellers, they just sign the first offer, even though they might be able to get a little more. They just want it done, uh-huh. right? And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's someone's perspective. It's their asset. So the more people you can talk to and the more people you meet with, and then you have to – see, the key is, though, this is what no one talks about. You got you to gotta execute at the appointment, actually deliver a valuable appointment, because when you don't, you, can, you know it's not – have you ever had an appointment that you knew wasn't going well? Yeah. <laughs> right? How long does it take to see it's not going well? Uh, not long. long. A couple minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. So you've got to catch them at the beginning with how you show up, you know, a professional greeting, right? Uh, Xander from our team talks about this all the time, looking someone in the eye, shaking their hand and saying hello. And then, but then you, it can't just be that. It's got to be facts, data, education. I'm here to help you and go over what their goals are. And if you have that approach, you're going to win more than you lose, but you got to be meeting people all the time. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, it's literally like, you know, if you want to sell, you know, you've got some big goals. What's your, what's your appointment goal for the week? Oh, at least 10, 12. And that includes showings, yes. right? So yeah. to me, it, it like I'm, I'm looking to set five appointments a week, mm-hmm. new people I'm meeting with, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking to be in the field and have 12 opportunities to sell a house. Yes. What's your appointment goal? Uh, 10. 10, right? So that like this is not someone that's sitting around waiting for like a deal to fall in their hands and then like hope it goes well. And in a market like this, the more people you meet with, the better off you are. Because there's going to be a lot. And then there's going to be a lot of, like, client maintenance. It's not like you're done with these people in 30 days. So right. that, to me, is is going to be the most important thing as we head into this confusing time here where there's a lot of stuff happening. And it's not going to it's not gonna get any less confusing with this election coming up. I can tell you that. Right. So let's take a quick break. We're going to come back. We are going to talk about what I see as positive news from Fannie Mae. This is going very under the radar here. I don't even know if uh, – I mean, I was talking to Brian, our sales manager, about it today – We're going to share that. I got some lender insights on it. We also have some news on the commission lawsuit from NAR next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. For the best local mortgage service and great rates on your money, look no further than Mortgage America. We have been operating in the greater Philadelphia area for 40 years with a focus on smooth, easy access to home purchasing. Whether you're a first-time buyer, upsizing or downsizing, or just refinancing, we have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and access to subsidized interest rates. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. To learn more, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. We always have a person available to take your call with around-the-clock human service. Purchase your home with the personalized local service you find at Mortgage America. Mortgage America is an equal housing lender, NMLS 128501. I'm Tom Tool of the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. If you're thinking of becoming a real estate agent in the greater Philly area, I have a special offer for you. Our team did $165 million of volume in 2021, making us the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania and a top 1% team nationally. Our agents love us because we offer them a successful career, a great life, and an unbeatable culture. Agents who've been with us for at least a year average 30-plus sales. Even our brand-new agents average 17 to 24 sales a year. We offer proven systems and expert training. We help you set more appointments and sell more houses. Now here's the offer. 
If you don't have a real estate license yet, we offer real estate scholarships so you can get one for free. Check it out at realestatescholarshipprogram.com or visit the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline at tomtool.com. That's Tom Tool with an E dot com. Get more out of your real estate career and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low-down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. Mortgage America is deposit under NLS 128501. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacy Mitchell. She's Sarah Timon. We all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018, and we are streaming live on YouTube. We're going to be talking about this news from Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac, excuse me. No one's talking about this. I saw a couple under-the-radar things yesterday. This was issued yesterday. Maybe it's because it was tax day yesterday. It might have had something to do with it. <laughs> very, very important here. So if you like what you hear, you get some value out of this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, click on the bell for notifications, and if you want to talk to one of these two ladies about your real estate needs, Make sure to click the link in the comments to schedule a call. So I want to go over this letter first. I mean, the commission lawsuit we, we can talk about, but this this came out yesterday and it was from it was to Freddie Mac sellers. And the subject is commissions paid to real estate agents. And here's what it says. It, it's like three paragraphs. It comes from Kevin Kaufman, the senior vice president of single family seller engagement. I, mean, I don't know what that means. It must be like some department over there or something. Um There have been recent inquiries concerning a proposed settlement agreement subject to court approval entered into by the National Association of Realtors in the Burnett et al. and Morrill et al. cases. The industry letter addresses the current treatment of property seller paid buyer agent fees under our interested parties contribution requirements. So how how agents get paid. So in Guide section 5501.5, property sellers are permitted to make financing concessions toward the borrower's closing costs in maximum amounts between 2 and 9% of the property value. Fees or costs customarily paid by the property seller according to local convention are not subject to these financing concession limits. Buyer agent fees have historically been fees customarily paid by the property seller or property seller's real estate agent and as such they are currently excluded from these financing concession limits if these fees continue to be customarily paid by the property seller according to the local convention they will not be subject to financing concession limits it is our standard practice to continuously evaluate our requirements to determine whether updates are appropriate based on changes to the market and industry we will continue to monitor and assess the impact of the proposed nar settlement and other real estate agent commission lawsuits to determine if any updates to our requirements are necessary. So what do you two think about this? Are you confused? I'm confused. (laughs) I mean, so I guess, so is it saying like if it is no longer, like if it's no longer the local convention that the seller is paying the fees, then even if the seller were to pay the commissions, it would no longer be excluded from the percentage that they're allowed to pay out. So like if you, I guess if the seller was going to be paying the commission for the buyer's agent and let's say there were like inspection things that came up and there was like a seller assist, like all of a sudden what they would be able to offer would be less. Is that correct? So I'll tell you what it says. I got a source on this because this is very confusing. Um, Eamon Cantwell from R5 Home Loans. You guys know him. Yes. Um, so he he sent me he was he sent me this like yesterday at two o'clock. Like, my man, thank you, major uh, credit for sending this to me. And I, I I'll just read the conversation. Does this say what I think it says? It doesn't mean that you can finance a commission, at least not yet. But what it does mean is that on an average conventional deal, you are capped at three percent seller's assist, which we already know. Sometimes they go up to six. It depends on closing costs. This says that the concession for buyer's agent compensation doesn't get factored into that number. 
So as long as an appraisal is good, you could have a 3% seller concession and the seller can pay a, you know, X to Y percent commission for the buy side agent. So it's a baby step, but important nonetheless. So what they're moving towards is it won't count towards the closing cost because it's not, it's not the norm. So there could be an additional concession outside of that that isn't capped on the borrower's closing costs and maximum amounts. I'm still confused. So it's not gonna so you have your you have your seller's assist, right? I'm gonna give some round numbers here. Okay. Let's say the assist the, the total closing costs for the buyer are ten thousand dollars. It's never that even, but let's just let's say that for hypotheticals here. You're not capped at a ten thousand dollar seller concession. You could have a an additional concession that wouldn't count towards that closing cost allotment. If the appraisals are the appraisals okay, so that's obviously the key here. That's where it gets a little dicey because when, when you start jacking up the appraisal number, right. it doesn't really help. Got a it. small step here. I'm surprised we hmm. heard anything from Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae. Wow. That 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 was the the biggest shocker here. So that's one component of this. It's a start. It doesn't mean that th- this stuff can start happening yet. There's going to be a lot to unpack here. Now we've got. Some other news coming out of the Supreme Court, uh, but what do you what do you think about that move by Fanny by Freddie Mac? There, I mean, is that are are you happy? Do you feel like it, you like something a little more aggressive? What do you think here, Stacey and Sarah? Well, I'm surprised that they actually put something out so quickly, <laughs> um, but I think that they're trying to get in front of this, which is always a good thing, uh, you know, for because there's there needs to be options. Mm-hmm. So to me, I think it's it's positive that this is a you know there it's a small step in the right direction. Yeah, and I think about I think that talking about it and like addressing some of these different things, so maybe some stuff can be ironed out prior to changes going into effect is definitely better than you know finding out afterwards that you know there's going to be additional hurdles that maybe weren't anticipated. Mm-hmm. My my hope is that I, I think I think mortgage lenders are going to have to do something because this is really going to cause a lot of problems for folks be, because if they're not like I mean it just I don't know how this is going to all work because we know that most buyers don't have the cash to pay these commissions although right. we've seen it happen with a couple people we've had people on our team we've had uh, folks at our firm I mean I I know people out out of state they have had they they have had buyers write checks for the balance of commission. It's happening, and there hasn't been a, a lot of pushback on it yet. I think it's going to be tougher when they, people don't have the cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think those situ- those um, uh, situations that happened, I, that's not the norm. I mean, it, well, it's, it's the it's start. Not the, it's, yeah, we don't, right. we don't know. It, it's, we, the sample size is too small. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the majority of people that I'm working with now are so cash-strapped. Yes. Um, they, they just don't have the extra funds. They just don't have it, so... Uh, and that's part of their concern too. You know, they want to get something under contract before situation really changes. But yeah, I, I agree that, um, something has to be done. I think that the lenders are definitely considering what, what's going to happen because this could, could be very negative across the whole industry. So getting things in place before everything changes in July is, uh, is the way to go because you don't want to try to catch up after July and try to, <laughs> right. you know, write the ship after that. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, I look at this, I think there's going to be a lot of the people like the buyer is, is, is winning here in a lot of cases because I don't, I've never seen the industry so buyer focused before for the two plus decades we've been doing this. But I look at this and I see what goes on with listing agents sometimes. Right. And, and I, I the, to me, a good listing agent is going to be fighting for the buyer agent because it's so much easier selling a house when you've got everyone showing it for you than if you're going to shut these people out. Mm-hmm. And it's also going to be better for the seller, right? Like imagine you have someone under contract or you do, Sarah, and especially like forget, you know, the high price stuff. I think I look at the lower priced homes. I think that's where you really run into these issues a lot where people literally have like enough for a 3% down payment. Or a three and a half percent down payment, and that's it. And they're getting an FHA loan or a conventional loan, and they're scraping pennies together to get into a house that's two hundred, three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, which is below our, our median here. So a good listing agent is going to talk about, hey, this is going to get you more because there's going to be more competition. So that's my hope. Now, unfortunately, 
we've dealt with good and bad listing agents, all of us here. I, you know, I, I don't know what's going to be said. That's what I'm. That's, that's what I'm most concerned about as as we move forward here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you don't know what's on the other side. But I, oh, you know, when I'm talking with sellers, um, if if they question what's happening, you know, I. It, I always um, encourage, yes, it's it's definitely positive to offer compensation to the other side. Right. Because to work with another agent to make a smooth transaction, that's everything. Yeah. You know, that's keeping the transaction together. Right. When you have to negotiate, there's so much that could potentially happen. So to have a competent person on the other side, it, it really makes a huge difference. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and I mean, it's called cooperating agent for, for a reason. For a reason. So, um, and you know, that, that's, that's probably what's going to be most important to realize here. So with that in mind, so we had another development in the commission lawsuit case. Now this is very fascinating. So home services. Um, so Warren Buffett is the owner of home services. Home services are like a subsidiary of his companies. And the U S Supreme court denied the petition filed by home services to overturn the verdict on Monday, um, and the verdict's going to stand, and that leaves Home Services as the only defendant who has not reached a settlement. Uh, meanwhile, the plaintiffs have filed against Home Services for the entire trebled amount of damages, $5.4 billion with a B dollars, minus the $626.5 million they'll receive through the settlements with NAR, Anywhere, Remax, and Keller Williams. So if Home Services can't reach the settlement, they could be on the hook for $4.7 billion dollars um and you know uh the executive vice president of home services chris kelly said he wasn't surprised by the decision um and he firmly believed that the arbitration issue they raised through their petition was an important matter given the conflicting interpretation of the federal arbitration act at the circuit court level we certainly understood the odds and the very limited number of cases the supreme court selects it was just one of many paths we believe were important to pursue so I'm not totally shocked by this year. I'm wondering if home service is going to settle. And that that's my big question. Um, and uh, I mean, do, like, how do you think this plays out? I mean, they kind of got left out to dry here by NAR and all this. It's, it's unfortunate. This is the way this went. So what are your, how, how do you see this goes? This is like the last piece to fall here with this case. Well, yeah, since there was already so many other settlements. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm curious about whether they're going to try to settle. Um, I mean, they could be on the hook for I mean, that's a huge number. Right. $4.7 billion. And if they do decide to roll the dice and go let it go to, um, you know, appeals, then they it still could come, be the same outcome. So, I, you know, I would assume that they're going to try to negotiate some type of settlement to mitigate their, their losses. But it looks like, um, you know, that that would probably be a path forward for them at this point. Um, I don't know if somebody would, if a big company like that would be willing to risk it. They also have a market cap of $896 billion. So mm-hmm. I think that, I think that's what's, I, you know, it, every mm-hmm. one of these cases, we got the maximum amount we could get, right? That, that you heard that from anywhere. You didn't hear it with the Remax settlement, but it looks like that was the case. You heard it with, NAR, and they basically said we were going to have to like use that tool of bankruptcy, which they should have done, but they didn't. If we didn't, if we had to continue down this path, so I think this has a lot to do with it. They're just looking at how, how what's the maximum amount we can get out of these people. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's my view, at least. So if they don't come to like an agreement and settle, like the cap would be four point seven billion that they would be left with. And they've already used most channels that they can go through. I, I, I don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. I mean, that's what we don't know. I, I'd imagine there's other stuff happening here. Because I would assume as they start to run out of avenues to go down, settlement would seem more and more Well, they could appealing? still appeal the case. Okay. Yeah, and so I he, think that's what they're doing, right? They're so appealing it. Here's where we are. So here, here's the latest. So, um, you know, back in February, um, Home Services filed a petition with the Supreme Court mm-hmm. arguing that the 8th U.S. Circuit of Appeals oversteps its decision to reject arbitration agreements and proceed with the class action lawsuit. Um, then Home Services asked the Supreme Court to reject the trial and its uh, verdict, arguing that an arbitration agreement was in place and should have been enforced, um, and that the 8th U.S. Circuit of Appeal dismissed that, um, and 
Then the appellate court also noted that Home Services had effectively waived its right to arbitration by litigating the case for nearly a year before filing its motion. And the goal of filing the petition with the Supreme Court was getting uh, the ca- either getting the case thrown out, which didn't happen, or ensuring the uniform nationwide uh, application of the Federal Arbitration Act. Now, you do have to go through all these steps, even though if you don't think it's going to happen. A- any attorney is going to tell you that. Like, if you know... Even with small small stuff, right? Like you got to, okay, I'm going to file for arbitration. No one wants to go. I'm going to do this. Nobody wants to go. The Supreme Court uh, dismissed their petition, uh, and that means the verdict stands. And the lack of any further comment leaves the second objection in limbo. The Supreme Court ruling follows the rejection of another home services petition to decertify. Uh, this, this is a class action suit, and that was dismissed back in March. So... The question in this article, and BAM did a great job putting this together, so what, what options are left? They can continue to fight the ruling. Uh, the ju- Judge Bo has uh, set a due date of April 23rd for post-verdict motions and final responses, including a request for a new trial. Home Services is also embroiled in a conflict with Sitzer Burnett over the latter's request for the, the damages, and they've responded to the request by arguing it's too soon to issue a judgment. And the plaintiffs then pushed back and accused Home Services of asking the court to deprive the class of many millions of dollars in interest to which it's entitled. So, I don't know. I, I think this is going to settle. I can't imagine. But, they, see, they have the biggest bankroll here out of anybody. Right. That, that's the difference. I mean, this is not just a real estate company. This is a right. gigantic corporation that has a market cap of over $800 billion. Yeah. So, it really just depends on how far they want to push it. Because right. it really won't, it, do, it doesn't seem like it's going to hurt them at all. Right. Financially, it's not. It's a drop in the bucket. <laughs> exactly. Well, I right. think that's the thing here, right? And yeah. so, I mean, they're, you know, it's, they're looking at it like, hey, like, let's just, we, we, we can do what we want to do. I mean, you know, I would love to see the verdict get overturned. I just don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So a lot of commission lawsuit post effects as they still continue to happen here. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of a fixer-upper purchase because Philadelphia was ranked the number 10 city in the country for buying a fixer-upper, which we're talking about affordability and finding a home. This is something that more people than ever are considering. So we'll unpack that next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. You shouldn't have to deal with all the red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or online bank. At Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and detailed service of a local bank. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast settlements, low down payment options, and first-time homebuyer programs. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. For more information, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. Mortgage America is Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. The Tom Tool Sales Group is the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania with over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows Greater Philly better than we do. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. We hire the best agents and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX main line at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's Tom, tool with an E, dot com. Sell your home for more and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. Mortgage America is the equal housing lender, MLS 1 
All right, welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacey Mitchell. She's Sarah Time, and we all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we are talking about the best and worst cities to buy a fixer upper. Philadelphia was named number 10 on this list in the best cities to buy a home that needs some work. And if you like what you hear, you get some value out of this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, click on the bell for notifications. And if you want to schedule a call about your real estate needs with one of these two ladies, make sure to click on the link in the comments. So I found this article very interesting because we are talking about like affordability and people are having to compromise on, on homes. And I mean, have you had anyone go from like, I want to buy like a move in ready property to a fixer upper? Has this happened recently to either of you guys? I have had that happen. How did it go? Like, what was the process? Like, give us some perspective here. Uh, so for one of them, these were clients that I'd been working with for a very long time. Um, and as the market changed, uh, you know, some things adjusted. They did make adjustments on their end. And I think they were always open to, like, you know, small cosmetic things. And then what they actually ended up getting was a going to be, like, a full rehab. Um, and I think it was just seeing what they could get for their money. And they also weren't afraid of a project. Like you have to have not any, not everybody can just be like, Oh, I'm going to do a fixer upper. Like you have to have the right mentality for it. You have to have some patience. You have to have some vision. (laughs) Um, You can't, um, it is not for everyone. Yeah. It's definitely not for everyone. And and you could tell, uh, you know, when you're talking to clients, um, if and they have to have the right vision. Mm-hmm. You know, if some of your clients are going in houses and they're like, oh, we could do this and we could do that and we can move this around, they have the vision. Mm-hmm. They could do a fixer upper. Um, but there's many levels of fixer upper. Right. <laughs> there's full gut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I have clients that specifically bought full gut yeah. rehab. They wanted to get in, you know, at super low pricing, you know, competing with investors basically, because they knew they were gonna do this, but they had the experience. Uh, they had the fortitude to do it. So, um, but they're the only ones. If you're doing a first time home buyer, oh no, unless right. like the parent is a contractor yeah. or something. <laughs> right. Now, I do have some first time home buyers who have like the, the one of them was a contractor or they knew, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they were fine with it, but it wasn't a full gut by any stretch, but it was more like an outdated, like yeah. livable, yeah. but had to be updated. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. Like, um, could they, move were they doing the work prior to moving in um some were go, moving in and going to do the work as yeah. they live there and it was more like uh, a house like 70s or 80s 80s frozen in time mm-hmm. house mm-hmm. which is livable because yeah. somebody just moved out yeah it just needs totally updated but yeah. there's been homes that i've sold where no you have to do work before they get in yeah well and that's what did. that's what eric and i did we mm-hmm. got one that was we did all the work before we we moved in, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's, um, but see, and, and your that wasn't your first house though. And I think that, and it's also a house yeah. I imagine you're planning on living in a long time. Right. right? And mm-hmm. it's like on probably the, the, the street or the area where you want to live, where I think you see more of that because you bought for the location. Right. Right. So, and I, th- this is, these are the stats to consider here. And I want to make sure we got a couple minutes here. So the, the average turnkey home median asking price in the U S right now is $399,900. The fixer-upper median asking price is $283,000. So that's a 29% savings. And in 20 out of the 50 most popular metros, fixer-uppers can cost up to 50% less. So Philadelphia was named number 10, um, and it's the best combination of active listings and cost savings. Cities ahead of them were L.A., believe it or not, Um, Chicago, Long Beach, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Dallas, Fresno, Baltimore, Louisville and Philadelphia and what what they this is comes from a report called uh, from storage cafe and what they look at here is you know they look at the additional cost that buyers may undertake um, and obviously this you know varies from city to city because you have to look at the rehab cost is probably going to be the same for the most part uh, but it's what what's the price point going to be when you're done that's probably why LA is number one because People, you know, like you fix up a home. I mean, we've seen these shows like they put in like 100 grand. It's like it raises the price like three. I'm like, what what kind of ROI is this? This is bananas. So 
you know, knowing that Philadelphia's got some opportunities here, we also know that 73% of respondents to a survey earlier in the year from Remax said they would consider purchasing a fixer upper. How do you help people navigate this? Because like you said, it's not going to be for everybody. It's definitely not for some, I mean, you know, I've done work to homes, but never like a fixer upper. Like it's not, and, and you know, you guys went through it, you and you and Eric, Sarah. So I think that's mm-hmm. a, what, what, what's some advice you have for people that are making, that are considering a fixer upper right now? So I guess there would be a couple pieces, one of them being like timeline. Um, And is it something that you need to do the work prior to or some of the work prior to or can you like live through it? And then also can you potentially balance a mortgage on because depending on the extent of the renovations, it's not going to happen in three weeks. You know, you're looking at even if it's done at like a quick pace, you're looking at several months if you're doing a full rehab. Mm -hmm. Um, So for that time period, can you carry, do you have, where else are you going to live? Can you afford to carry both mortgages if, or rent and mortgage? Um, Always plan for some overrun or for some unforeseen issues and vet your, you know, vet your contractors (laughs) um, and get them in. Like, and honestly, if you're lucky enough to be in a situation where you have time to bring in the contractor before making an offer, best to kind of know your expected costs. Um, because it's, you know, two homes on the same street could be in completely, both of them like fixer uppers. They could be, it doesn't mean it's apples to apples. So, Mm -hmm. um, I guess making sure to get a realistic ballpark number of, where your prices are going to come in at, and then like line up all those pieces and see if it makes sense. Well said. Yeah, that's perfect. Very, very good advice. And also, it, it, it you know, again, I go back to if it's a tradesperson that's buying this for themselves, which I've had that, mm-hmm. they, they know what they're getting into um, for the most part, although there could be uh, other things that have to be considered, like is it on a well or septic? Mm-hmm. And if it's septic, still do your inspections. Um, I had a client buy um, a house. It was every all the contents were included, and it had septic. And we did the septic inspection, but waived everything else. Mm-hmm. Failed septic, so the sellers did. They had to credit for yeah. the new septic. So, and that's not that cheap. would have been a thirty-five thousand yeah. dollar expense on top. Yeah. So know what you're getting into is the advice here. Talk to some professionals like one of these two ladies here. So uh, that's what we got for this week's episode. You want to follow Sarah? She's at Ty underscore Ty Time on Instagram. You can follow Stacy at the number two Mitchco. You can follow me at Tom Tool 3RD all on Instagram. And we'll be back next week on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM.